It is so awesome to be with you this evening, and it's so nice to see it. it actually turned a little bit nice this afternoon, huh? I tell you what, I'm really looking to for more, for more sunshine. Uh, anybody else? I tell you what, I'm done with the rain. Anyway, hey, we are going to uh, be in the Gospel of Matthew tonight, continuing our study uh, chapter by chapter through the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4, so if you have your Bible with you, turn to Matthew 4. We're going to look at the first 11 verses. The title of my message tonight, one of my favorites, When Temptation Comes A-Knocking. When Temptation Comes A-Knocking. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time to be in your word. And we pray, Father God, because we know when it comes to temptation, this is something every single one of us, because of the fall of Adam, struggles with every day. And yet we thank you that your word gives us principles to live by, Father God, but not in a legalistic way because of our relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the victory that is ours in Jesus, and now I pray as we study your word, you would show us how to make this so practical that even tonight we would begin to walk more in your victory, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen and amen. You know, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus, before he sent out his disciples to share the fact that the kingdom of God was at hand, gave them these words. He said in Matthew 10, verse 16, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. The reality is, is we live in a fallen world, and it doesn't take too long to figure it out that in our world, the truth is called a lie, and lies are embraced as truth. Correct me if I'm wrong. Wouldn't you agree? And, and also in this fallen world, we see temptation surrounded by it. All you need to do is turn on the TV. All you need to do is flip open the laptop. All you need to do is turn on your iPhone, and you have it at your fingertips. And since the fall, no one is exempt from it. Yet as believers in Jesus Christ, we are called to be slaves to righteousness, not slaves to sin, according to Romans chapter 6. And tonight, we're going to discover important principles for overcoming temptation when it comes knocking, by looking at the example of our Savior Jesus Christ and also at all that he's done for us because he's been raised from the dead and he's given us the Holy Spirit and his word. Let's begin in verse 1 of Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, <clears throat> all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Verse 11, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Now, 
A couple of weeks ago, we were in Matthew chapter 3, and we saw in verse 15 that Jesus was baptized, and he declared that he needed to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And when he was, this literally marked the beginning of his earthly ministry. Through baptism, Jesus was identified with those he came to save that they may enter into his kingdom. Now, right after that, we are told in chapter 4, verse 1, that Jesus was immediately led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Some believe it's the area of Jericho, which would be northwest of Jerusalem, to be tempted by the devil. And the question is, why? Why start off the ministry that way? Well, I want to tell you what it doesn't mean. It's not to confirm that Jesus is the Son of God. He is. It's not to receive the Father's approval. He already had it. For we're told that when he was baptized, the Father declared from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But it was the Father's will for Jesus to be tempted so that he would be identified with you and me fallen humanity and to show creation that Jesus Christ is our mighty conqueror and to serve as our example of how we can be victorious over temptation because it is for freedom that Christ has come to set us free according to Galatians chapter 5. Through this also Jesus exposed Satan and his schemes so that we may learn and that we may grow and have that victory. So let's look at these schemes of Satan and discover how Jesus was victorious so that we walk in his victory. And the first thing I want to highlight, because I want to make this very, very practical tonight, because I know it's something that we all deal with. And in fact, if you're here tonight and you're saying, well, I don't deal with it, you're lying and you just gave in to the temptation, okay? We all struggle with it. There are three forms of temptation. Three forms, three general forms, three general categories, or three ports of entry when it comes to temptation. According to 1 John 2, 16, listen to this. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Those are the three ports of entry. Let's look at each one of them because this is what Satan was trying to cause Jesus to fall by. First one is found in verses 2 through 4, the lust of the flesh. In Matthew 4, 2, we are told that Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And then it says... He then became hungry, and I'm thinking, it took him that long? For me, it's about 15 minutes, right? And if it's Chinese food, make it about five minutes. What took him so long? And while he's physically weak because of fasting, Satan attacked Jesus. Remember that. Because often, Satan waits for us to be worn down. Oh, we could be good all day long and blow it late at night when resistance is low. Satan's first temptation appears to be straightforward. Hey, just turn these stones into bread. But there's more to the temptation than that. Let's paraphrase it this way. If you are the Son of God, use your authority to satisfy your body's desire for food. Now, we would all agree eating bread is not sin, right? Eating food is not sin, but at this point, the Father did not want Jesus to eat bread. It was God's will for Jesus to fast. Later, the angels would come and minister to him and probably gave him bread in verse 11. But right now, this moment, be set apart and do not eat. That was the Father's will for Jesus. So the enemy tempted Jesus to satisfy his flesh, even though it was contrary to the Father's will. In essence, 
Jesus, use your authority over your own body and do not submit to the Father's authority. That's the idea. It was an appeal to satisfy the physical appetite. And it's similar to how Satan tempted Eve in the garden. And I want you to look at Genesis 3, verse 1, and I want you to notice how Satan implied that God was restricting or holding back something good for, from Adam and Eve. Look at this. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Why would he do that? It's a good garden. He can't be serious. Why would he do that to you? Why would he withhold something good from you? What's wrong with God? There has to be something up here. Because you know what? All these trees in the garden are good. All of them. There must be something wrong with God that he would command such a thing as that. The appeal to satisfy the flesh is strong. Would you agree? The flesh always, and this is key, the flesh always seeks to gratify and satisfy itself. The flesh, what do I mean? The sin nature always seeks to gratify and satisfy itself. And you know what? Satan repeatedly pushes those buttons, temptation after temptation. Now, I'm going to be really vulnerable with you right now, okay? I'm going to be really transparent about two things, okay? But we're family, and I'm hoping you won't judge, okay? First thing is this. I love M&Ms. Anyone else? That hard candy shell melts in your mouth, not in your hand. But you know, I've tried that a few times. And usually I get these little red rings and green rings, right? It begins to wear down after a while. And you're thinking, what's so bad about that? Bear with me. It's the second thing I'm going to share with you. You see, I have a criminal background. It's true. Not a, proud of it, but it was on June 20th. Not last year, but when June 20th, right after I got done with my sixth grade year, I was hanging out with a friend, and we went to a store, and I had no money, but I started craving M&Ms. I like the nutty ones. Those are really good. But this time, I was gunning for the plain ones. And I went to the store. I had no money. I don't even know what I was thinking. You're right, I wasn't. <laughs> the flesh was. And I was in this candy aisle. My friend was somewhere else, and I looked this way, and I looked that way. And as I'm looking around, I noticed one guy passing by, but he's in plain dress clothes, and I made no, no deal about it. And I took the bag of M&Ms, stuck it in my jacket, and walked out of the store. And that guy, who was looking down the aisle, snagged me just as I was walking out of the building. He says, come with me. So I go upstairs to the office, and I remember having to call my mom. Not a very good phone call. I've had a lot of good phone calls. That wasn't a good one. Hey, Mom? Yeah, Matt, what's going on? I got caught shoplifting. And these are her exact words, Buster, your summer is over. <laughs> and mom, don't lie. It really was over at that point. And I came home that night miserable. What have I done? What kind of I, example have I set for my younger siblings? I'll, I'll never forget, though, my dad. He came to me that night, he had tears in his eyes. It just broke his heart that his son stole. But he said, you know what, I love you, Matt. And I tell you what, those words changed my life. I never wanted to disappoint him again. I've been reformed. Now, that's right, there you go, that's right. You can. 
<clears throat> I learned my lesson the hard way. I tell you what. I still eat M&Ms, though. <laughs> I just buy them. I don't steal them. But the fleshly desire is strong, isn't it? We all get it. So what's the response when you have that fleshly desire? I struggle, I'll be transparent again, with eating late at night. And isn't it interesting? That's when the resistance is low. You can go and be good all day long, and then you're just sitting there, and you're bored, I'll eat some food. You do that for a while, you're going to have some problems, wouldn't you agree? I know I've struggled with my weight over the years, and I think a lot of it's related to this. But Jesus gives us a solution. Jesus answered Satan with God's word. He said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, Deuteronomy 8, 3. You see, Jesus came to do the will of the Father. In John 5, 30, he says, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Therefore, Jesus was content with temporary hunger because he lived to do the Father's will and refused to submit to the enticement of Satan. You see, when we put our physical needs ahead of our spiritual needs, we sin. And if we let circumstances dictate our actions versus God, we also sin. The most important thing for us as believers in Jesus Christ is to feed on and obey God's word. It's more important than food, and you'll never have a regret. That's why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 27, listen to him speak here. He says, therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. I buffet my body and make it my slave lest possibly, after I've preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. I'm not going to let the flesh win, Paul is saying here. I have a higher calling than that. And it's because of Jesus Christ he can say those things, and we can too. You see, Adam and Eve failed on this point, but Jesus was victorious. The second one is this, the boastful pride of life. It's found in verses 5 and 7. Now, at that time, this is very interesting. You've got to look at a little bit of context here to understand what Satan is trying to do to Jesus. Jews believe that Messiah would suddenly appear. Some of them believe that he would suddenly appear in the sky and then come down to his temple because of Malachi 3.1. Look at this. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Now, there are several facets to Satan's scheme here. Humanly speaking, the temple was the perfect place to reveal that Jesus was the Son of God because there's always someone there. But God had a different plan for Jesus. And Satan, true to form, always seeks to undermine the plan of God. He tempted Jesus to show off or to prove that he was the son of God by jumping off the pinnacle of the temple, which was 450 feet above the Kidron Valley. That would be quite a show. Could you imagine those angels swooping in at that moment? That would wake people up, wouldn't you agree? But to follow Satan and accommodate the expectations of others is not God's will. It's sin. Since Jesus answered the first temptation with Scripture, I find it interesting that with the second temptation, Satan uses Scripture. Okay, you're going to fight me with Scripture? Try this one on. I'll use Scripture. Let's see what you do with that now, Jesus. And so he tempts him to jump or to show off. Why not? Hey, the Bible says you can jump and you won't get injured. Your foot won't even strike the ground because he will give his angels charge concerning you. He's quoting from Psalm 91, verses 11 through 12. And let's look at all of this together here. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you. Look at this now. I want you, if you, if you have your own Bible there, underline, in all your ways. That's key. They will bear you up in their hand, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now, 
This is like Satan's temptation of Eve. It was an appeal to personal gain. An appeal to personal gain. Genesis 3, 4. And the serpent said to the woman, look at this, you surely shall not die. You see, the flesh always seeks personal gain. It seeks to gratify itself, to satisfy itself. It always seeks personal gain, especially if it appears there won't be a consequence or a cost. But Satan here misquotes Scripture, intentionally leaving out in all your ways. You see, this passage means that God will protect the person who is following God's will. Did you get that? The person who follows God's will will be protected by God. So we must be careful to rightly understand and rightly apply God's word. I'm reminded of a funny story that Pastor Chuck Smith once told. He founded Calvary Chapel, and he told a story about his son. He was going to discipline him. He was going to give him a spanking, and his son decided that he would use the Bible to help turn the tide with his dad and hope, hopefully win him over and not get his spanking. And this is what he said to his dad. He said, Dad, the Bible says to parents that they need to spare the rod and spoil the child. <laughs> get that right there? He's misquoting scripture. It didn't work. It never does. And again, Jesus responds with the word of God. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, Deuteronomy 6.16. You see, if Jesus yielded to Satan's temptation and jumped, he would have been testing God by forcing him to do something outside of his will. If we put ourselves in a place that forces God to intervene and is contrary to his word or his will, we are putting God to the test because we're making God man's servant rather than man God's servant. You know, I believe God can heal. Amen? Anyone else? But unfortunately, there are those that would, I believe, at times, put God to the test in this one. I believe God can heal, but I also believe he uses medicine to heal, right? He can use doctors to heal. He can use a variety of ways to heal. And I praise God for the the medical advances that we have for today. But I've known of people that would take this idea, for instance, if they were a diabetic. Is God able to heal your diabetes? Yes. Okay, then why don't you just take that step off the pinnacle And stop taking your insulin. You're putting God to the test there. You see, at that point, have we not asked God to move at our command? You see what I'm saying here? I think we have to have the attitude that we see with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. They were standing before Nebuchadnezzar. They were refusing to bow down to the image that he had erected. And Nebuchadnezzar said, you know what? You guys are going to go into the fiery furnace if you do not bow down. And they said, you know what? Our God is able to save us. But even if he does not, we will not bow down. We will submit to the Lord and let him do what's best. We're not going to put him to the test. We're going to trust him and let him work out the outcome. You see what I'm saying? That's the better attitude. But the problem today is too many people are concerned with their outward circumstances and are oblivious to as to how God wants to change the inner man. You see, God wants to do something through the trials to strengthen us, to make us mature and complete, lacking nothing. James 1, uh, verses 2 through 4 says this, "'Consider it all joy, my brethren.'" When you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So again, Adam and Eve failed, but our Savior was victorious. Let's look at the third temptation, the lust of the eyes, verses 8 and 10. 
Now, for the third temptation, Satan took Jesus to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he offered them to Jesus if he would bow down and worship him. And the emphasis in the Greek here is just once. Just bow down once, and all of this will be yours. Now, the question is, does Satan have the authority to offer the kingdoms of this world to Jesus? And I find it interesting that the Apostle Paul calls Satan the God of this world. So it appears that at this time, he holds great influence over much of the world. And I'm sure when you look at what's going on, you would agree. 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. But here's the key. The kingdoms are not Satan's forever. That's important. And our God is still on the throne. Amen. He is on the throne. Now, what was the nature of the temptation? Satan offered Jesus the kingdoms, and this is key, without having to endure the cross. Just bow down once. The infinite Son of God, worshiping the finite, fallen foe, Satan. Satan was saying, here's a shortcut. Here's an easy out. And you know what? It's very similar to the temptation of Eve by Satan in the garden. It was an appeal to power and to glory. Genesis 3, 5, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Eat that fruit. You can bypass. Here's a shortcut. Power and glory are yours. Just listen to me. Just listen to me, because that God, I don't know what he's thinking. You surely won't die. I don't know why he's withholding that from you. Don't you know you can become, become God? Your flesh will be satisfied, your eyes will be satisfied, and your pride will be satisfied. You see, the flesh always seeks to glorify self. I mean, let's be honest, just look at the selfies on Facebook and Instagram. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, do people really post ugly pictures of themselves? No. It's always the best pose, right? It's always the best story, right? Oh, it has to come from this side because that's my bad side, right? You always see that. What do you see? That, that pride of life there, that lust of the eyes. But the reality is... You know what? Jesus, our Savior, defeats the enemy here again. And he uses Scripture. He says, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. We can only serve one master. Only one. Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. Now, this is important. The Father had already promised to Jesus the kingdom, but not a temporal one, an eternal one. Psalm 2, verse 8, ask of me, this is the Father speaking of, to the Son, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. Our Savior Jesus Christ knew there were no shortcuts to the kingdom. It was the Father's will that he would carry a cross before he would wear a crown. And you know what? If we want to share in Christ's glory, then we must be prepared to share in his sufferings. And I know that's not a popular message in our culture, but we have to stick with what the Word of God has to say. And there's nothing to be ashamed of because there's so much that we can learn from. And I believe there's an eternal weight of glory for all the sufferings that we are going through in this fallen world if we walk by faith. 1 Peter 5.10, and after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. I can't wait for that day. How about you? So here we see, 
Adam and Eve failed on all three points, and that's why we have a sin nature, a fallen world. But Jesus Christ, through his life, ministry, death, and resurrection, makes available to all of us the opportunity to be victorious over temptation. And yet, the enemy's still at work right now because he wants us to think those areas that are defeating us, that's the way it always has to be. But the Word of God makes it clear, no. You see, the moment someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ, we were in chains, we were shackled, but the prison door is open and the chains come off. But many people remain in the prison cell because of the lies of the enemy. But God has given us his word. He's saying, brothers and sisters, it's time to get out of the cell and start living the way I intended you to live life. Live it to the full through Jesus Christ. Amen? God wants us to be victorious. No more the enemy getting the final word. No more the enemy getting the victory. And I want to give us tonight a battle plan for overcoming temptation. I want to make this very, very practical. You see, what we do before temptation hits, when temptation hits, and after temptation hits will determine victory or defeat. I want to make this so practical. So before, let's look at that first. What should we do before temptation comes our way? Strengthen yourself in Christ. Any soldier will tell you before they're put into the battlefield, what do they do? They go through basic training. They get themselves ready. They get themselves prepared. Why? If they are not prepared, they will get picked off. Right? It's going to happen. It's only a matter of time until we're tempted. Wow, thanks for that word of encouragement, Matt. It's the truth. So we need to be prepared in advance before the temptation comes. And now what I'm talking about here is not a formula. I'm not about religion. It's about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You see what I'm saying? So this is not a formula. Well, if I just do A, B, C, D, and E, then everything's going to go hunky-dory. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about a relationship with God through Jesus Christ where his resources are empowering my life, looking at the world from a different vantage point so that I can see sin for what it is. I can see temptation for what it is, and I know what the flesh is wanting, and I can walk in victory. Each day, I believe we need to do these things, though. It's a part of that relationship. You see, I I believe we must choose to put on Christ so that we may stand firm against the schemes of Satan and not give in to the lust of the flesh. For instance, Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, 10, and 11, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Look at this. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. The full armor of God, he goes on to say, is what? The belt of truth? That I'm going to gird myself with God's truth. Fit, feet, my feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That in all my ways, I'm walking in the gospel of God's grace. The helmet of my salvation. Why? Because I need to guard my mind from the lies of the enemy. I need to remember who I am in Jesus Christ. The shield of the faith so I can extinguish the flaming missiles of the evil one and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Put it on every day. We need to be prepared. Again, not as a religious ritual, relationship. Paul also says in Romans 13, verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. You know how I interpret that one? If I'm filling my life with Jesus, there's no room in me for anything else but Jesus. I'm choosing Jesus. And when temptation comes knocking, I know what the answer is. Not at home. Get behind me, Satan, right? Very important. Now, in order to put on Christ daily... We must be in communion with Christ through prayer. 
so that we may receive his power and ask for his protection. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, and that word everything in the Greek means everything, everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, look at this, shall guard like the armor of God, your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's something miraculous that happens as I draw near to the Lord in prayer. He responds by giving me his covering. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. Jesus was asked by his disciples, how should we pray? And one of the things he taught his disciples to pray is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I want to make this real practical. We should be praying that before the day starts. Lord, you know what's coming down the pike this day. You also know my weaknesses. Before I even venture out of this bed, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me, Lord. I want your victory because I want the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart to be pleasing in your sight. I don't want to look back on the day and say, man, there's another wasted one. I want your victory in my life. Now, in addition to prayer and putting on Christ, we also need to be strengthened by the truth of God's word. And you know, in a church like ours where we're teaching through the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, it's easy to coast. And I want to challenge you tonight. Let us be Bereans who are in the word for ourselves. Let me tell you something. If I or Pastor Rich ever say something that's contrary to the word of God, run, don't walk for the nearest exit, but talk to us first to help us out. We're all in this together, and the Word of God is the final authority. We all need to be in the Word. We all need to be studying it to show ourselves approved. Psalm 119, 28 and 30, strengthen me according to your Word. I have chosen the faithful way. I have placed your ordinances before me. Okay, so we talked about before. We're all geared up now. Now here's where the rubber hits the road. What happens during temptation? Take every thought captive in Christ. And notice that word captive there. It's aggressive. This is war. And we need to be aggressive with our thought life. You see, and this is really important, temptation is not sin. And people sometimes feel, I just had this thought. And all of a sudden, I sinned. Is that true? No. Temptation's not sin. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. The fact that we are tempted doesn't mean we've sinned. It's what we do with the temptation that determines whether or not we've sinned. That's why it says in James 1, 14 through 15, look at the progression here. Temptation, it becomes sin when we allow ourselves to be carried away by our own lusts, but each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Temptation is not sin. It's what we do with the temptation that determines whether it's sin or not. Therefore, the moment a tempting thought comes to mind, lust, pride, coveting, fill in the blank, take that thought captive. Reject it in the name of Jesus Christ and choose to fill your mind with godly thoughts. Go back to putting Christ on. You see, it's not just an event, it's a relationship. And there may be multiple times throughout the day where I gotta keep coming back to the Lord. Keep coming back to the Lord. I need victory, Lord. I need victory. The battle's not done yet. 2 Corinthians 10, verse five. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So I take that thought captive. 
I reject it, and now I want to fill my mind, Philippians 4, 8, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. When that temptation comes, I want to encourage you tonight, in your minds, in your heart, flee, don't flirt with temptation. Don't pull a Samson, if you're familiar with the story. I mean, the woman, Delilah, made it very clear. Show me where your strength is so that I may afflict you. You'd think there would be some red flags triggered by those comments, don't you think? Right? Something's kind of wonky with the relationship. And he just flirted with it. I can get myself out of it. I can get myself out of it. I can just get myself out of it. Dangerous. Christ and his righteousness is our escape route. 2 Timothy 2.22, now flee youthful lusts and pursue righteousness faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. I'm going to flee the temptation. I'm going to pursue righteousness. That's what I need to do in the middle of the temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation, look at this, provide the way of escape also, that you may be able to endure it. What's the way of escape? Jesus, our Savior. I'm choosing Jesus. I'm going back to what I prayed earlier in the day. I'm choosing Jesus. And what we're doing here is we're submitting to God. And as we submit to God, he pours out grace on us and the devil flees from us. James 4, 6 through 7, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I flee the temptation, but I'm resisting the devil. As I'm submitting to God, he gives me a greater grace and I can get victory over the temptation. And after that, you're gonna feel so encouraged because you realize, God, you just gave me victory. I never thought I'd have victory over that area. I love those M&Ms, and I just said no to those M&Ms, to God be the glory. But there's always an after. And I wanna encourage you to stay alert in Christ. You see, though the devil will flee when we submit to God, we need to realize he's gonna come back again and try again. In fact, that's what happened with Jesus. Luke 4, 13, and when the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. You see? Well, when did that happen? Well, Satan used Peter to tempt Jesus. But Jesus took the thought captive, rebuked the enemy, and proclaimed God's truth. Matthew 16, 21 through 23. From that time, Jesus Christ began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised up on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. See, he's taking captive the thought right there. You are, not, you are a stumbling block to me. He's calling out the truth, for you're not setting your mind on God's interests but man's. That's what it looks like right there. Satan comes back, but Jesus was ready for him. And we must stay alert and not get lulled into complacency. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, be of sober spirit, be on the alert your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith. But as we get ready to close here in just a moment, <clears throat> some of you might be thinking, but yeah, it's a little late, Matt. What do you do if you fall? What do you do if you've become a trophy on Satan's mantle, what do you do then? I've got good news for you. 
whenever we fall, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our God is a God of new beginnings. Just be honest with him. And let him begin to rebuild your life all over again. We can't fix yesterday, but we can choose Jesus today. Amen. You see, his victory is our victory. And that's God's heart for us. That every moment of every day, we would experience the victory that is ours in Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 37. But in all these things... We overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this time in your word tonight. And Father God, we come before you, and I'm praying in the name of Jesus for all of us, if there's an area that's a stronghold, if there's a foothold, in the name of Jesus for my brothers and sisters, that you would break those chains, Lord. And every single one, as we bring those things to you, would begin to experience your victory as we apply the principles from your word to our lives. Church, with eyes closed and heads bowed, if you're here tonight and you're saying, Lord, I want to walk in your victory. All that you have for me, I want to experience it over every aspect of my life. Would you just raise your hand and say, Lord, I want your victory. I want your victory over every area. I want to give it to you. I give to you my weaknesses. I give to you my faults. I surrender all. Lord, I raise my hands too. And I thank you for your victory. I thank you for all that we have through Jesus. And Father, as we leave here tonight, may we be more aware, may we be more alert, but may we also be so thankful for the victory that is ours, for greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said,